Asalaamu As Alaikum, good evening. <laughs> okay, um, before I start, I want to thank um, Brother Ishmael for inviting me and the SOAS Spirituals Dialogue Society and each and every one of you for coming. Oops, yeah. Can everyone hear me? Is it clear? Okay. There's quite a lot I want to cover. Um, before I start, I want to kind of first talk about, I first introduce myself and say who I am, a bit more detail in terms of what um, Sister Safia said and why I wanted, to, why I wrote this book, Illuminating the Blackness, Blacks and African Muslims in Brazil, and what it's about, what I'm trying to basically do with actually this particular book. Um, this is my fourth book I've written. Um, it's basically, for anyone that's familiar with my first book, Illuminating the Blackness, I'm Illuminating the Darkness, Blacks and North Africans in Islam, which talks about the issue of racial discrimination, colour prejudice in Islamic history, while kind of basically trying to investigate the whole issue of anti-black racism, which is a taboo subject within a lot of Muslim communities. How did that come about by basically investigating and researching you know, like early Muslim scholars and how they tried to combat that particular issue within the Muslim community and the effects that it has on Muslims now. This book is a follow-up of, of my first book. Um, some of you might be asking how is Brazil connected to Islam and Okay, how is Brazil connected to Islam? Or why am I talking about, or how am I talk, or why am I talking about the issue of race and African Muslims? What's the connection, which I'll try and quickly describe and explain, and then I'll explain more hopefully in my talk. First, I'll explain the subtitle, which is Blacks and African Muslims in, its, in Brazil, which some people might be asking, what's the point? Because I get this a lot for some reason. Um, some people think I'm trying to cause a divide by saying like blacks and African Muslims or blacks and North, North Africans, which I mentioned in my first book. Firstly, I'll explain why this book is talking about the issue of racism and colorism uh, and the, Brazil's African Muslim heritage. So it's, it, there's two parts of the book, one which is talking about the issue of racism and colorism, or more importantly, anti-black racism and colorism. And the second part of the book is talking about Brazil's African Muslim heritage. Now, as we know, you can be an African and you can, and you can also be not, and you can also be like, for example, white. So by Africans, I'm referring to Africans as a, as, a total, as a whole, for example. So I'm looking at West African Muslims and North African Muslims. And obviously some North African Muslims are not black. So that's why I've used the term African Muslims in the subtitle. And by blacks, I'm referring to anyone who self identifies as black. I saw a couple of people giggling. If you're North African and your fair complexion considers yourself black, yes, you're black. I'm not saying you're not black, but some people who are fair in complexion might not consider themselves black, which is a whole other topic altogether. But so that basically explains the subtitle because I always get asked that question a lot. Okay, so now going into that overview of the book itself. Um, okay, so the first two bullet points is basically part one of the book, which is talking about the history of anti-black racism in Brazil. How did that start and how did that, um, and how is that basically affecting Afro-Brazilians today? And then I also explore the various forms of resistance amongst Afro-Brazilians um, into combat, uh, combating anti-black racism. And again, so I'm looking at Afro-Brazilians as a total. So I'm not only looking at Afro-Brazilian Muslims, okay? So I'm not only looking at Afro-Brazilian Muslims, I'm looking at Afro-Brazilians as a whole, how they basically, the various ways they're trying to combat the issue of anti-black um, racism in Brazil. Because for those of you who do not know, Brazil is a racist country, which I'll kind of explain the reasons why, despite it being portrayed as a racially um, a racial democracy, and we saw obviously images of the carnival and you know the Brazilian football team. For anyone who's familiar with football, you see you know different colours and everyone's laughing and smiling. And it is, don't get me wrong, it's a very friendly country and everyone is hospitable to you when you go there or if any of you were to go there. But you will see the the inequality between the blacks and the, the whites. Whereas unfortunately the blacks, or again by me using blacks, I'm talking about people are black and mixed race are generally at the bottom and the people are, uh, at the top are the whites who generally hold all the power. So I'm looking at, for example, the different forms of resistance amongst Afro-Brazilians in terms of combating this particular issue. In the second part of the book, um, tracing Brazil's African Muslim heritage, I'm primarily looking at the West African Muslims in 19th century Brazil, primarily in Bahia, um, and they led the number of slave revolts, which I'll talk about. And then I'll also talk about the Islamic revival in Salvador, Bahia, which is a northeastern region of Brazil and how the Islamic community, particularly amongst um, Brazilian Muslims, how they're trying to revive Islam and, and the, 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 certain, the different issues that they're kind of facing and how they draw, drew inspiration from the 19th century Muslims in um, Bahia to kind of embrace the faith and things like that. So that's, that's how that's connected. But that's the overview of the book. Um, some people actually might be asking, where is the book? 
um, because this is supposed to be the launch. But unfortunately, I had a couple of issues with um, uh, I had a couple of issues with the, with the publisher, so it's been delayed. Um, so I do apologise, and um, hopefully, it should be out within the next couple of um, months. So just in case you're wondering, like, where it's a book, it's not actually out at, at the moment. Quick introduction to Afro-Brazilian and Islamic history. Um, just quick brief facts. For those of you who don't know, obviously we know about the transatlantic slave trade. When people think about the transatlantic slave trade, they generally think about the United States of America and the Caribbean. And not many people know, maybe because obviously Brazil, Brazilians speak Portuguese, um, the slave trade, the impact that slavery had upon the Afro-descendants in Brazil, because 10 times more Africans were enslaved and transported to Brazil than there was, than there was transported into America. So that in of itself, a lot of people when they, came, when they think about slavery, they think about the United States of America. You've seen all the, the many films and the books, but little is known about the slave trade which, which occurred in, in Brazil, which I kind of wanted to talk about. And uh, another quick fact, which not people are probably not aware of, in the 19th century, because I shall start from the beginning, quick, quick overview of the timeline. Am I speaking too fast for some people? Because some people look in a bit lost. No? Okay, good. Quick timeline. Slavery, um, Portuguese first arrived or traveled to Brazil in 1500. In terms of when they first started transporting Africans to Brazil, that started in 1538. Between 1538 and towards the end of the 19th century, they mainly transported Africans from Central Africa. And in the 19th century, they then started to transport Africans from West Africa, from the Bight of Benin, modern day Nigeria, and, and Benin. Now, a lot of these West Africans, it's reported that 30% of them were Muslims. So 30% of the, of the West African Muslims that were transported primarily to Bahia, which at the time was the capital of Brazil, which is now Rio de Janeiro. 30% of them were Muslims, and, for, and a lot of these Muslims, they, came, they were educated, they were knowledgeable about the religion of Islam, and they were um, warriors because of, there was a lot of civil wars and jihads going on in their country in Nigeria and Benin. And a lot of them, they fought for their, or they tried to fight for their rights, and they led a number of slave revolts, which we'll talk about a little bit later, which is known as the Malay slave revolts. The word Malay is, um, it's from the Yoruba word, the Yoruba, the Nigerian language called Imale, which means a Muslim. And uh, it's, it's, it's made up of two words, Ima means ad, and um, le means knowledge, so ad knowledge. And that's what the Muslims were known as in Brazil, primarily the Yoruba Muslims. Um, if anyone's interested in learning or reading about this particular, about the West African Muslims in Brazil, particularly the slave revolts, um, there's this book in English, there's one in English, there's one in Portuguese, called Slave Rebellion in Brazil by um, Professor João Jose Hayes. That's a gentleman I'm sitting with on the right hand side. Um, it's probably the most comprehensive book, so if anyone's interested, I would definitely recommend anyone to kind of read that. Um, and he's kind of been helping me in terms of the research for my book and um, a couple other projects that we've got hopefully in the future next com um, com coming years, inshallah. Another quick fact that a lot of people are not aware of, I'm not really going to go too much into detail in terms of slavery because that's not really the main focus of my particular talk, but I just want to explain some important points which explains the context of Afro-Brazilian resistance and where they drew their inspiration from. In the 17th century, there was a number of runaway African slaves who led uh, who created an uh, independent maroon society in Palmeiras. And this independent, um, so this independent African state, shall we call it, um, it consists of obviously primarily Africans, also Afro-Brazilians. Brazilians were born in Brazil, but or African descent, and even some, um, some white people as well. And this independent state lasted for approximately 100 years before the Portuguese captured their leader, who's known as Zumbi, from Palmeiras, and beheaded him on the 20th of November, 1695, I believe. And in honour of Zumbi, because of what he did, and he was very courageous, um, now the 20th of November is regarded as Black Conscious Day in Brazil, which is a day which the Brazilians, um, particularly those of African descent, um, celebrate um, you know, their history, they try to, you know, learn more about their kind of their heritage and kind of to, to try and encourage them to kind of encourage them to do better things, basically. So that's what the, the Black Country State is about, and that's, that's the origin of it. I mentioned um, earlier about the slave revolts, which occurred between 1807 and 1835, which was led primarily by West African Muslims, mainly from the Yoruba and Hausa ethnic group. Um, which I'll talk about a bit, a bit later, but that's just a, a brief introduction in terms of to this topic. 
Now, the racial democracy myth in Brazil, like I mentioned a, a couple of minutes ago, when people think about Brazil, especially in terms of race relations, people think it's a racial democracy, as in because you see, I mean, most people, most of the population are of mixed race, whether they're dark in complexion and phenotypically looking like they're from like African or very fair in complexion. Even the people that are as white as snow have got a bit of, whether it's indigenous Brazilian blood in them or African blood in them. So they are a, a mix of, they are mixed nation. Yet despite that, there is an issue of um, colorism and racism, which we'll talk about. And this particular painting illustrates what was uh, a conscientious uh, issue in Brazil, particularly in this um, 17th, 18th and 19th century, where after slavery ended in 1888, the Brazilian government wanted to whiten its population. This is not conspiracy. This isn't something from, you know, dodgy websites. This is a fact. This is, was government policy. They wanted to whiten the population because towards the end of the 19th century, after slavery was abolished, there was more blacks than whites. And now they're in, going into the industrial age. They wanted more. They wanted to obviously the country to progress, and they wanted more sophisticated <coughs> workers. So therefore, they needed to go to Europe, and they subsidised for a number of European immigrants to come to Brazil. Um, and also, to, for hopefully, for, for they, so they can mixed, mix and have obviously relations with the black and the indigenous population. And the, the thought was that they will whiten the country and eliminate the black problem or the black race. And this particular painting that was, um, it was 1895 yeah, by a Spanish painter illustrates that where you've got the black grandmother, her mixed race daughter, and the mixed race daughter's partner on the side. Now you can see the black grandmother is, um, she's praising God because her granddaughter, or grandson, sorry, is obviously clearly, like, definitively European and very fair in complexion, so the blackness has gone. And this was part, this was something that, it reflects uh, the desire of many of the, even the black and mixed race persons at the time, the, the idea to be white. And there's this idea that you should marry up not only in terms of for social mobility, but in terms of to eliminate the blackness. And it's an issue even now, unfortunately, amongst um, a lot of Brazilians, where this idea that anything that's white or linked to Europe or Europeans is seen as somewhat superior or better than people of African descent or, or people that's dark in kind of complexion. So I, mean, I just wanted to kind of quickly show this particular painting because it's quite important and just understanding um, the issue, because you have to understand the context as well, I want to quickly explain that. And it's also the painting, and anyone who's aware of the, the Curse of Ham story, it's called The Redemption of Ham, linked to the Curse of Ham story from the Bible in Genesis, where, a quick overview of the story, where um, according to the Bible, Prophet Noah is said to have cursed Canaan and his descendants with servitude. And in some traditions, in the Muslim tradition, it says that he cursed him with blackness. And that's called the Curse of Ham story. And, that's, and Ham is seen as being the forefather of people of, Afri of, people of Africa. So, where, so black people are seen as, are supposed to be subservient to others because of this curse. And that's why he's named the particular painting, The Redemption of Ham. Okay, I want to talk about some positive things, because everyone's looking a bit, it's not all going to be like depressing. It's all going to be depressing, but I just want to, to understand the context of, because again, if I'm talking about, and the reason why I needed to show some of these things, because um, sometimes I get a bit of pushback when people ask me, why am I doing what I'm doing? Or just basically talking about the black issue. Um, why am I not talking about other races? Um, me talking about anti-black racism, you have to understand the issue that a lot of black people, people who are dark in complexion are facing, for you to understand why there's this idea to celebrate blackness and talk about the achievements or contribution that black people have um, contributed in society. So that's why I, I, I had to kind of show... Well, you're doing well, you don't have to do this. Defending yourself, you're doing really well, continue. I appreciate that, brother, you're but there's some people... I appreciate that, brother. <laughs> I appreciate it, but there's some people that don't understand, so that's why I have to explain it to them. But I appreciate, I appreciate your comment. Thank you. Okay, now the issue of black and blackness. This is something that, according to the 2010 census, 50% or just over 50% of Brazilians consider themselves, you can say, black, either because they self-identify themselves as either black or mixed race. Now, in previous censuses, censuses, more people, will, even the people that were brown in complexion will kind of self-identify themselves as white because they didn't want to be considered as black. Now, because there's a growing um, black consciousness movement, because of the works, which I'll speak later of, 
um, certain African-American activists and people that's going to be and they're highlighting this particular issue because in Brazil, another thing that you need, need to kind of understand is that how we kind of maybe describe someone according to the way, uh, um, like if, if we say someone's black, we mean ethnically they're from, maybe from Africa. So we use the term racially to describe someone, right? Or if we say someone's white, we generally mean they're of European descent. Whereas in Brazil, how they describe, how they even self-identify themselves is relatively. So you might find, for example, this particular lady here, who's obviously mixed race, she might self-identify herself as being white, right? And I know that might throw some people, and she might self-identify herself as being mixed race or black. How she, it's all how she kind of, how she perceives herself. And even other people will kind of consider people who are even brown in complexion. If someone, for example, has got straight hair, that is a, an attribute, for example, of whiteness or white people. So even someone who's brown in complexion, like this young lady, but she's got not maybe you could say kinky hair, then she could consider herself to be mixed race or white. And even someone who's dark in that, so it's very, it's, 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 it's very complex how they use race. And, it's, and it's, it's similar to the traditional Muslim countries, how they used in early, um, in the Arab lands, how they use color to describe themselves, where some Arabs might consider themselves as black in comparison to people of um, fair in complexion. They might consider themselves quote unquote white in comparison, to, in comparison to maybe the black Africans who are dark in complexion. Yeah, so that's why I wanted to kind of explain that, unlike in this country where we might consider someone who's obviously very fair in complexion, but because they've got African ancestry is black, even, they're, even though they're mixed race, in Brazil it's, it's very different. People use terms, they use the terms relatively, and even someone themselves might describe themselves as being black, white, what have you, or different shades of brown, and another person might uh, consider them a kind of a different colour. Because of affirmative action laws which came into um, came into effect, I think, about 2003, which basically um, the Brazilian government wanted to, they wanted to help their black pop the black population by reserving a certain amount of spaces in universities for people of African descent and native Brazilians as well, because generally they make up the, the poor. So they said, that, for example, we might, for example, in Salvador, where the population of people, 80% of African descent, Yet, despite that, in the universities, up until maybe 10, 15 years ago, only about 7% of the students were black or mixed race. That's clearly an issue. So that's why they introduced these racial quotas, affirmative action policies. So they said, for example, at least 40% of places has to be for black and mixed race people. Now, because they did this, then you found a shift amongst a lot of people who are maybe, you could say, mixed race, who previously described themselves as white, saying that they're black. Do you understand that? Do you understand the, 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 understand the context of why the affirmative action, how it had an impact in terms of how people view themselves and because of the growing black consciousness movement, because the black consciousness movement is growing in Brazil, um, which I'll talk about again, I'll say a little bit later. That's why you're finding more people who might have previously um, described themselves as being somewhat brown, light skin, all different colors. Now they're kind of describing themselves as being black and, find, find, and finding pride in their heritage. So that's something I kind of talk about in the book. I also look into the issue of, I kind of mentioned before, the history of anti-black racism. There's a number of marches going on. Um, this is one particular march which, where this particular lady is ca carrying out a placard talking about the genocide of black people. Um, and yeah, I mentioned earlier about the abolishment of slavery in 1888 and what the policy of the white Brazilian government was to try and er eradicate the blackness of society by importing a lot of Europeans. So initially, they subsidized for a number of Europeans to come to the country and then they allowed Arabs and Asians primarily from Japan to come into Brazil and even a lot of Japanese who are now in Brazil they're kind of considered white by some people which is obviously very different obviously in this country and then I mentioned that earlier so I'll kind of go to the next slide the issue of colorism I'm kind of all of time. I want to talk about colorism and just how, I'll give you a quick example, for example, this lady on the, and I wanted to show you examples so you can see what I'm talking about. This is some ladies I interviewed. The lady on the left in the blue dress, she considered herself to be white, right? Even though she's mixed race. I mean, all of them are mixed race. The gentleman in the middle, he considered himself to be black, whereas the two ladies in the, um, either side of that particular man, he considered, they considered themselves to be brown. And then there was a heated arg uh, the argument whilst I was talking to them because then the lady of the glasses says, you're not white because you've got a black father. But it's this idea, because she's got straight hair, she's fair in complexion, this idea that people want to ascribe to whiteness. 
Right, so this, this is just an example of how in Brazil, race is very complex and difficult to understand because especially if you're coming from a African, uh, African-American, USA, or British mindset and understanding of race, and you try to impart, um, import it there, you'll struggle because it may be in America, probably three of them, maybe other than the lady on the left, will probably be considered black somewhat because they've got some black blood because of the, the one black blood rule in, in America, which, which came into effect a couple of um, decades ago. Whereas in Brazil, it's totally different. So you could see even this, the gentleman in the middle, even though he considered himself black as in negro, some other people wouldn't consider him to be black because he's got straight hair. So it's very difficult and complicated to understand how um, race and skin colour is understood in Brazil, but it's all subjective. And like you've got the saying, beauty is the eye in the beholder, in Brazil it's like race is, the eye in the beho- is in the eye of the beholder. So I kind of wanted to talk about the issue of colourism and the issues that especially brown and darker skinned Brazilians face, because obviously, unfortunately in Brazil, like in a lot of other countries in African diaspora, the darker you are, the harder, you, the harder it is in terms of, and the more discriminated you'll be um, subjected to. Okay, I'll, I'm not gonna really talk about that. Uh, this was in the Salvador. Um, again, because of time, I don't really wanna go, go into too much detail about the African influences in, in Brazilian culture. Uh, I want to go into, actually, I want to quickly talk about this. The Afro, in terms of like, you know, also about activism or Afro Brazilian activists, this is one particular group and this will link to hopefully when I'm talking about the African Muslims in Brazil. Ilaye is a Yoruba word, a Nigerian word meaning house of life, and it was set up to raise the consciousness of black Brazilians. Up until like about the late 1960s, the carnival was specifically for white people. The black, black people that were allowed to go to the carnival only occupied some of the sides of the floats. And that's why you had um, groups like Ilaya, which was set up in 1974, where they set up their own carnival mu- music group. Now, groups like Ilaya, and I'll talk about Olodum later, it's not just about music, it's about raising the self-esteem of, of black people. And they also set up a number of private schools where they teach black people about their history and their, heri- excuse me, their heritage. And again, the ultimate purpose of this is to raise the consciousness and self-esteem of people of African descent, particularly in cities like Salvador, which is like uh, the population 80% black. Another Afro-Brazilian um, activist group, Olodum, which um, became really famous after Michael Jackson. I don't know if anyone's, does anyone remember this song, this music video? Can't be that young. Yeah, they don't really care about us where um, he was wearing um, their T-shirt and this particular group was founded in 1979 and it's similar to Ilaya Ila, where the purpose is to reaffirm um, black identity and, and raise black consciousness. And the word Olodum is, um, from, is derived from the Yoruba word Olodumare which means um, the most high God in Yoruba, the Yoruba language. Now I want to kind of talk about the stages of Islam in Brazil. I'll say there's four stages. I'll split into four stages. The first stage is African Muslim explorers. When people think about Brazil, people think about or, or Afro-Brazilian history, they think of the period of the transatlantic slave trade, as in that's when it started, when in fact there's a number of reports from archaeologists, historians and the like of African Muslim explorers travelling to the Americas and Brazil in the 9th, 12th and 14th century. Um, and also the second stage of, you can say, Islam in Africa, Islam, Islam in Brazil is of the enslaved Muslims, which I mentioned earlier in the 19th century. 30% of um, the West Africans that arrived in Brazil were Muslims um, between the 16th century to the 19th century. And they were primarily of the Yoruba and house ethnic um, group. And then the third stage, you can say, is of the Arab Muslim immigrants, immigrants primarily from Syria and Lebanon because of the... Um, the whitening process where a lot of Brazilians, the Brazilian elite wanted to subsidize for white people to come into Brazil. That later initially it was for Europeans and then they allowed for Arabs and um, Asians, primarily Japanese, to come into Brazil like to whiten the population because they were seen as more sophisticated and nearer to whiteness and Europeans than the blacks. Most of the Arabs that came to Brazil were Christians but some of them were Muslims and that's why there was, there, there was a Muslim presence in Brazil um, from the 19th century and early 20th century. But a lot of the Arab Muslims at that time, they kept themselves to themselves. So that's why um, 
Islam didn't spread as much as it, as it probably should have. Um, and, and then the final stage, which I'll talk about towards the end of my presentation, is um, from the 1990s up until the present day, where there's a revival amongst um, Brazilians, primarily Brazilians of African descent um, living in the favelas, who are, because of a number of reasons, which I'll talk about later, reverting to their Islamic past and I mean, embracing the religion of Islam. I'm only going to talk about the first stage, the second stage, and the fourth stage um, for this particular talk, because obviously the, the talk is the history of um, Islam in Africa and Caribbean. Why well, it should be South America as well, but. Okay, so we've got African Muslims in Brazil before the Portuguese. Like I said, there's a couple of reports. The first report is by an Arab historian called Alan Masoudi, where he talks about um, an African Moor. Um, a Moor is a controversial term. Some people consider, I mean, they're the North African. Some people consider a Moor to be someone who's of North African descent. Some people say that they're Arab, of Arab descent, but they are, some people say they're black people. So I'm not really going to go into who the Moors actually were, because it's, it's open to debate. It's div there's many differences of opinion, but they generally, they were the, you could say they were the people of North Africa, whether they were of Arab, Arab descent or not, but they were the people of North Africa. So there's reports of um, Moors traveling to the Americas um, in the ninth, se ninth century. And there's also another report from um, a couple of centuries later by an Arab geographer called Muhammad al-Idrisi in the 12th century of a report of a North African Moor traveling to the Americas and there's some evidence that they landed in Brazil. And then we also we've got another report in the 14th century, a couple, couple of centuries later, from, um, of Mansa Abu Bakari II, who is the brother and the predecessor of the famous 14th century ruler Mansa Musa, um, which Baba Rashid mentioned in his talk. And basically he, the, a summary of the report is that he was the leader of the Mali Empire at the time, and he sent for a ship, or a couple of ships, for people to tr travel to see the unknown land. One of the ships came back, and the other ship was apparently lost at sea. So he, he wanted to search and to try, because he was seeking knowledge and see what, what he wanted to find out what's on the other side of the, of the ocean. So he went with, I think it was about 2,000 ships, and there's some reports that he likely, he's, he, he likely landed in Palmeiras. The reason why we know this is because there were some reports later when the Portuguese landed in Brazil a couple of centuries later, they found gold from Mali. So that's like the evidence that they landed, um, in, um, probably landed in like the, in Brazil and other parts of the Americas. But other than that, other than these few reports, there isn't much information that we know about um, the African Muslim explorers who traveled to Brazil other than they probably landed there. And, and there's a couple of, there's a, Muslim historian called um, Sheikh Abdul, Haki, Abdul Hakim Quick, who wrote a book called Deeper Roots, which kind of goes into a bit more detail and it gives a lot of lectures about this particular topic for those of you uh, who might be interested. And then um, the part of the second stage, we are talking about the stages of Islam in Brazil, are the slave revolts. There were a number of slave revolts which occurred in Brazil between, eight, between 1807 and 1835. The most famous of these slave revolts was in 1835, led by y the Yoruba Muslims. Um, and the reason why we know more about this particular slave revolt um, in comparison to the previous one, not because it had the most impact, not because it had the most impact, because there was a lot of documents that was left behind. So that's why a lot of historians later were able to kind of do some research in terms of trying to understand what were the motives behind, um, what were the motives behind Africans who revolted, why they revolted, and there were a number of investigations that took place. The, this particular revolt, 1835 revolt, took place in... Um, on the 25th of January, corresponding to the 25th of Ramadan of that particular year. And um, there's, there's um, because what they, what they did was, for the benefit of the non-Muslims in, 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 in this order, it's obviously Ramadan is a holy, holy month for the Muslims, and particularly the, um, the night of um, the divine decree called Laylatul Qadr, which is either one of the odd nights of the last 10 days of, of, the, of, the, of Ramadan. And there's reports of the Muslims, they wanted to start this revolt on Laylatul Qadr because it's seen as obviously the best night in terms of from the Islamic perspective of the year and hopefully they'll, divine, they'll get some divine grace. So they planned for the revolt to take place on, on the 25th, thinking it's, either, it's probably going to be Laylatul Qadr because normally like the 25th or the 27th. Um, but unfortunately there was an informant from amongst the Africans who informed the Portuguese about this particular um, revolt and that's why before they were able to kind of really take the city to ransom um, 
you know, they were caught and uh, a number of the Muslims were prosecuted. Some were deported back to Africa um, and uh, quite a few were imprisoned. And anyone who was seen to have any Islamic or Arabic documents in their possessions or in their house was immediately uh, sent to prison. So because of this, the aftermath of this particular revolt was that, number one, it did scare a lot of the Portuguese or the Brazilian elite at that time because the African, a lot of, again, they were primarily the African Muslims that they were revolting, but they were encouraging a lot of the African non-Muslims to revolt as well and to not, to not accept this life of servitude. So that's, so I wanted to kind of, again, like talk about this particular revolt and the impact that it had. Um, and then after the, another thing actually about the, about the African Muslims, which um, Professor Hayes mentions in this particular book, which is very important, is the literacy of the Muslims. At that particular time, a lot of even the Portuguese elite were illiterate. Whereas a lot of the Muslims, because obviously we know from the Quran that the first verse telling the Prophet Muhammad the peace upon him to read Iqra, reading and literacy is a very important part of the of the of the Islamic psyche or the Muslim psyche and understanding in terms of to gain knowledge and to better yourself. And a lot of these, even though a lot of these or all of the African Muslims were enslaved, they still bought and read Qurans. And some of you might be asking, how did they manage to read Qurans if they were living lives of servitude? There was bookshops which sold Qurans and they were able to save a bit of the monies that they gained from working in addition to their duties as slaves to buy Qurans. And also when some of the other Muslims were being transported from Africa to Brazil, some of them, they, they hid um, parchments of like writings from the Quran, verses from the Quran. And they found, any time they found pieces of paper, parchments, they'll write verses from the Quran and, and, and hold them and use them to set up Islamic schools as well. They had a number of um, secret Islamic schools which they taught the Quran and, and they taught people about the tenets of, of, of the faith. This is a painting that was, um, I, think, I think it was in the late 19th century by a Frenchman who visited Brazil. The, I mean, you can clearly tell these are Muslims, one by the garb of the person sitting down and if you look at the person that's lying down, um, that's a, a, the, 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 it's a Islamic therapy called the hijama, cupping therapy, which is quite popular amongst the Muslims. Um, so this is a, a painting that he drew of, of the African Muslims in Brazil, in 19th century Brazil. There's another painting that he drew, which you can clearly again, it demonstrates the African Muslim pre presence in, this is actually in Bahia, which is in northeastern Brazil. You can see obviously the, the woman on the far left with the Muslim garb and the gentleman in the middle, I don't know what he's doing, but yeah, okay. So that's that. And then, um, you know, like I mentioned, after the slave revolts, a number of the African Muslims were transported, were deported back to Brazil. A number of the <coughs> Afro-Brazilians set up, or <coughs> they, um, they set up their own communities, in particular in Lagos, which is called Aguda, or Ajuda, and these are known as the Brazilian headquarters, and they still remain today in Lagos for anyone who's Nigerian or probably, probably familiar or, or has heard about them. And they set up and they built some of these mosques. So these are known as Afro-Brazilian mosques. This is a mosque um, in Lagos. And you know it's built by the Afro-Brazilian because architect is similar to the, the style, is similar to the, um, the way that the churches were designed and still designed in Brazil today. So this is um, an example of the Afro-Brazilian pre presence now in West Africa. Now, the fourth stage, which I mentioned, like the four stages of Islam, and then we've got the um, Islamic revival in, particularly in Bahia. This is uh, the Muslim, this is the Salvador Mosque. Um, the gentleman on the right with the suit, I forgot his name, but he's an Arab businessman from Sao Paulo. When he found out and heard about the Islamic presence in Salvador, he wanted to revive the Islamic presence, so he, and he met with the gentleman in the top left-hand picture called um, Mr. Wale Akani. He's a Nigerian. He, he went to Brazil to study initially. Um, and he also, he's also an entrepreneur, has got a couple of small businesses. And the two of them, along with a couple of other investors, they said they, they bought this particular building. It was a house um, and they wanted to use it as an Islamic cultural center and a mosque. And because of the Islamic heritage of, of Salvador, he, wanted, um, he also wanted the African, especially, especially like a Nigerian sheikh, uh, a Nigerian Imam to lead, uh, to lead the Muslim con congregation. So they called for this gentleman in the top right hand corner, Sheikh um, Ahmed Abdul Hamid, um, to come from Nigeria. He arrived in 1992 and he's been the leader of the, uh, the Imam of the mosque since. Um, and this, I, I was fortunate enough to interview him and speak about 
how the Muslim community is going and things like that. And he holds a number of weekly classes in Arabic for both Muslims and non-Muslims. And he talks to people about, obviously, this, the city's Islamic heritage. And like I said, he delivers a number of lectures at various schools and colleges. And he talks about, I mean, the thing about Brazil, especially someone who might be wondering, for the Muslims, especially in Salvador, there isn't much, even for the women I was, who are obviously who are veiled and things like that, there isn't much, I mean, because Brazil is a tolerant country, there isn't much like Islamophobia. Um, I've been to Brazil four times now, even the last time, I just came back a couple of weeks ago. Even speaking to a number of Brazilians there, this was just after like the Paris attacks, there isn't like a much of attack on the Muslims, on, they're not blaming the Muslims, which is something which is, again, is very different, obviously, unfortunately, in Europe, where, you know, unfortunately, we've, you know, we've got Islamophobia is a big issue, but in Brazil, it's just really a case of a lot of people are, just look at Islam as a foreign religion. Either they see it as an Arab religion, or it's, not, it's got no place in Islam. So the work that they, that this, especially this particular Muslim community is doing, in terms of trying to inform Brazilians about this, their Islamic history, a lot of the Brazilians themselves actually wanting to find out and know about their Islamic heritage and African Muslim heritage. That's why they carry out a number of um, social programs. And they also, what, similar to what Brother Rashid was saying, it's about offering solutions, not just giving history and telling people we did this, we did that, we were great people. So, and that's something which the Sheikh and a lot of um, the Muslims in this particular community are trying to do. Where they're trying to give people practical solutions. They're not just talking about the theoretical side, of, the theoretical side of Islam, but talking about how Islam can help people and things like that. So that's why they offer a number of social programs, not only teach people about the religion, but um, doing a lot of work with, especially with people from low-income families and things like that. This is a picture of the um, Brazilian Muslims in Salvador, and I also wanted to briefly talk about. Um, the influence of African Muslim, African American Muslim activists like Malcolm X and hip hop music um, in the growing, uh, in the rise of Islam in Brazil. Because a number of the Afro Brazilians that I interviewed, they did say, especially those who are of African descent and like visibly of African descent, because you've got some Brazilians who are very, very fair complexion but might be of African descent. I noticed that, especially a lot of the Brazilians of African descent. They spoke a lot about hip hop music and like figures like Malcolm X in terms of why they wanted to kind of know more about Islam. So Malcolm X is you know, very popular and big out there. And because obviously the work that he did in terms of talking about um, black empowerment and things like that, it was something that especially a lot of Afro-Brazilians living in the favelas, uh, the slums could identify with. Because unfortunately in Brazil, a lot of the black Brazilians don't really talk about the issue of race and racism up until maybe the last maybe 10, 20 years. That's one of the reasons why Mal figures like Malcolm X is very popular. And also you've got hip hop music. Well, I would say not hip hop music now, but maybe the last 10, 20, 20 years ago was quite political and was, was seen as like a form of resistance. And that's another thing which resonated with a lot of Afro-Brazilians and why they wanted to find out more about um, their heritage. Because a lot of num a number of m hip hop artists will speak about resistance and learning your history, like figures like Tupac and stuff like that, which is why some of the um, Afro-Brazilians that I spoke to wanted to kind of find out more about Islam and eventually embrace um, the religion. And then um, just the last slide before we kind of open up for questions, I'm going over time. Yeah, currently the uh, Afro-Brazilian, the, uh, the, currently the Muslim community in Salvador, it's got about 500 Muslims and it's growing. They're planning to build another mosque. And like um, the Nigerian entrepreneur Wale Akani said that the Muslim community in Salvador it's gradually gr growing and they're holding the Islamic flag there, alhamdulillah. Now I think I need a break because I need a drink and <laughs> we're going to go to the next week.